welcome to worship. Good evening. Good evening. I'm sorry to call you out, but confirmation students, please do not sit together. Go sit with your parents. I'll be distracted if you don't, so I need to call you out. But, uh, welcome to evening worship. I'm so glad you're here for our Lenten worship service. And uh, whether or not you are excited as I am for some Old Testament fun. Uh, we gathered here to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Our first song is in our hymn book, which is the handout as we do contemporary music this Lenten season. <clears throat> Proverbs 
from Proverbs 9. Please read responsively with me. <coughs> Do not rebuke mockers. Or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise. And they will love you. Instruct the wise. And they will the righteous Teach the righteous. And they will have the The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. For through wisdom your days will be many. And your years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. If you are a <laughs> Our scripture for today comes from Genesis chapter 19. As I said, our Lenten series is going through some Old Testament stories. Uh, based on the prayer, you could probably pick that I, some weird stories. Some you might know, some you didn't even know that happened in the Bible. And so from Genesis chapter 19. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up and take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and left him outside the city. When they brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you will be consumed. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lord, your servant has found favor with you. You have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot flee to the hills, for I fear the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. It is not a little one, and my life will be saved. He said to him, Very well, I grant you this favor too, and I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the city was called Zor, and the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back and she became a pillar of salt. The word of the Lord. With a little context leading into that, you probably had no idea what would be coming in Genesis chapter 19. Now, not many of us know Genesis 19 off the top of our head. What story is coming there? Well, now hearing it through, you probably picked out a few words. If you know, kind of know the story. The few key elements are cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, sinful cities, Awful things happen there, and that's why God destroyed them. Probably one fact or trivia you did know. The other second trivia fact you might have known, Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt for looking back. So the two trivia things. So giving you a little bit more context, Lot is the nephew of Abraham, and he followed Abraham as Abraham followed God in pursuit of the covenant of being the leader and father of many nations, as numerous as the stars. Lot was in it with Abraham. So Lot and his family have made a home for themselves in Sodom, choosing a life of prosperity, ease, and success, despite the immorality of the city which both he and Abraham knew what was going on there. But the temptation to stay there was great. God also knew of the wickedness, wickedness that happened in Sodom. Sexual depravity, pride, gluttony, suspicious wealth, and not aiding the poor and needy. Therefore, all the innocent 
were suffering because of the powerful. If you read into chapter 19, you got to go back a little bit into eight, chapter 18. Chapter 18 is uh, Abraham talking with God. Starting at verse 20, it says, God continued to hear the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they are deafening. The sin of those cities is immense. Going down, God said, I'm going down to see for myself, to see what they are doing is as bad as it sounds. Then I'll know. The, set, the men set out for Sodom, but Abraham stood in God's path, blocking the way. Abraham confronted him. Are you serious? Are you planning on getting rid of all of the good people right alongside the bad? What if there are 50 decent people left in the city? Will you lump the good with the bad and get rid of the lot? Would you not spare the city for the sake of 50 innocent people? I can't believe that you'd do that. Kill off all the good and bad alike as if there is no difference between them. Doesn't the judge of all the earth judge with justice? God said, if I find 50 decent people in the city of Sodom, I'll spare the place just for them. Abraham came back, do I, a mere mortal, made from a handful of dirt, dare open my mouth again to my master? What if 50 fall short by five, would you destroy the city of those because five are missing. He said, I won't destroy it if there is 45. Abraham spoke again, what if only you find 40? Neither will I destroy it for 40. He said, Master, don't be irritated with me, but what if only 30 are found? No, I won't do it if I find 30. He pushed on, I know you're trying to have patience, Master, but how about 20? I won't destroy it for 20. He wouldn't quit. Don't get angry, Master. This is the last time. What if you only come up with ten? For the sake of only ten, I will not destroy this city. Our Divine Holy One is not satisfied with hearsay, and so it does a little reconnaissance to see if things are really that bad. It's interesting that even the Holy One does not rush to judgment without a first-hand account of the situation. That's definitely a lesson for us. Humans are often too quick to draw conclusions and act without finding out truth for ourselves. Apparently, 10 people didn't exist. God destroyed the city, but not without helping Lot and his family leave before the destruction. I like how the message translation ends this lot story with, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he was mindful of Abraham and first got Lot out of there before he blasted the cities off the face of the earth. Lot and his family found it hard to leave their adopted home of Sodom despite the wickedness. If you read past this chapter, you'll read that Lot was so tangled up in this corrupt system that when it was gone, he was in such a despair that he went on a drinking binge. The angel messengers from God warned them to hurry and flee, to not stop and look back. And when Lot's life disobeyed, she turned into a pillar of salt. For this, she became a symbol of indecision, and Jesus urged his followers in Luke chapter 17 to remember her as an example when their own time of trouble came. So what's a takeaway here for reading this story from Genesis? Should a catastrophe be read as punishment from God? Do floods and famines and earthquakes come because God is angry? The Bible's answer is sometimes and sometimes not. In Genesis, several of these catastrophes seem to just happen. They weren't a punishment or even a warning, though God did use them to advance God's plans. There's only a few like this one 
that God did take credit for. As usual, the Bible shows little or no interest in telling us the scientific facts about the destruction, but it does stress how it happened, not how it happened, but why. We as individuals tend to take our own individualized sin, but here it's the community as a whole who are both individually sinful and collectively sinful. Their actions as a community lead to the whole wide-scale destruction, wiped off the face of the planet, environmental disaster. As a collective, we too sin together. Future generations will bear the brunt of our failure to be good stewards of creation that the Holy One entrusted us to. Sodom was raised to the ground, destroying the area's vibrant economy, their vibrant, fertile ground to ash. Our lack of care for creation has large-scale consequences. If you study or even know of the interconnectedness of things like the waterways, international transportation of waste management, even air quality, as evident in our large wildfires that produce contaminated air that travels states away. These disasters, whether intentional or negligent, are harmful. We also ask who else in your, our community is then unfairly burdened by these choices that are seemingly made by only the powerful. Like Lot, we might find the lure of ease and prosperity a stronger lure than justice and care for God, our neighbor, and creation. Like Lot's wife, the temptation to turn back, even look back on the past where the world's standards say, we were successful, life was good, is a strong temptation. However, we must keep following God forward towards justice and care. Here is the good news in keeping moving forward God fulfills the covenant promises with Abraham. He cares for Lot and his family. God is still planning on restoring creation. We don't get bogged down with this reign of destruction, but rather an insight into a hopeful possibility of a restoration of creation. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn is on our bulletin, Insert Beautiful Things, a song that we did quite often last Lent.
sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. <clears throat> Holy Lord, you alone are God. Sustain your church in all times of wilderness. Give vision to those who lead. Give the wisdom and understanding to those who follow you. Counsel all who are faithfully lead people into the future, that all are present here and now are not just the future, but the present reality of the church. Merciful God, living Lord, you know our temptations. Sustain those who govern and legislate. Instill in them a sense of your justice and righteousness, that equity and peace would pervade all regions and nations of the world. Merciful God. Yeah. Holy Lord, you are our hiding place for all in distress. Draw near to exile, accompany those who are in transition, especially those who travel alone. In times of trouble, trauma, or illness, surround your people with your steadfast love. As we pray silently in our hearts, we lift up those names that are special to us, that are in our own prayer concerns. <clears throat> Merciful God, <clears throat> Holy Lord, you offer abundance to all. Bless all the ministries of hospitality in this place. Care for those who tend to the needs of others. Be with us as we learn to be your church without bounds, to learn from your word, even the weird stories that seem to just confuse us. Guide us and take care of us. Merciful God. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. So with the whole church, we pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, power, and glory, forever and ever. Let us sing together our final <laughs> song, which is also on the insert. Thank you. 
God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen.